Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're watching from at this time, tuning in to be a part of this moment. From around the world, different time zones, welcome, welcome, welcome to Kingdom of Heaven Embassy Ministries, and this channel is called Kingdom Living Now. And think of the name, Kingdom of Heaven Embassy Ministries. What is the purpose of an embassy in the world around us today? We think of nations that have diplomatic ties with each other. An ambassador is sent from each of those countries into the other country as a representative of that country. And there are different things that have been put in place to protect and to give a certain level of security to that ambassador coming into that country and representing his or her country to that country. Kingdom of Heaven Embassy Ministries is meant to represent only the Kingdom of Heaven, as it is said. We have the Embassy of the United States of America. We have the Embassy of uh, Germany. We have the Embassy of of France and the embassy of this and all these different countries. So we know that if we need, in, like in countries like Jamaica, we need a visa to go to the, the, the France, we know which embassies to go to. If we need a visa to go to the United States, we know which embassy. You can't go to the embassy that is of France to acquire a visa for the United States of America, Kingdom of Heaven Embassy Ministries. So it is meant to represent that which is of the kingdom of God and only the kingdom of God. So, welcome to kingdom living now. That is, that is supposed to be true for every one of us who have come to faith in Christ. And before you quick to, you know, give me a thumbs down or to turn me off or change whatever you're doing or whatever, check it out for yourself. Am I making this up? Am I making this up? Or is it true? Is it that which we ought to come into as the people of God? Check what the law pointed to. Check what the prophets, what the teachings of the prophet was pointing to. Check what the, 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 the New Testament, as we, you know, traditionally refer to Matthew starting the New Testament, but I, I believe that the book of Acts is actually the start of the New Testament, the activation of the New Testament. But, but check Matthew, check Mark, Luke, and John, and throughout the scriptures, what is it that Jesus Christ taught and preached, and what is it that he said about the kingdom of God? Am I making it up? Am I a cult, as some say? Am I teaching, you know, cultism? as some classify and say for a long time now, but it doesn't move me. I, I see and I've, and I've watched and as I read how the prophets were persecuted, Jesus himself made reference to that as he encouraged us today that we will be persecuted. But he said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So don't think that you're all that special and you know, you're unique to persecution. Anyone who follow Christ, anyone who will desire to live godly, the scripture says, you will suffer persecution. But we understand that the one who we have chosen to submit our lives to and to follow, he is with us, is there protecting, guiding, and comforting, and doing whatever is needed, even in the time when we are persecuted. The greater one lives inside of us. So we should focus on that, not focus on what's going on around you. Because if you do, you'll be distracted and you'll be taken away. You'll be imprisoned by the wicked one. And that's what he wants. That's the end result. So in the face of persecution, you keep your eyes on Christ. You keep, the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, that we should consider him who suffers such great contradiction against sinner unto blood, lest we faint, lest we faint. So, I want to encourage you to continue to stay focused, 
Continue in grace, continue with the Lord, continue with purpose of heart, as we see in the book of Acts. So we've been talking about the kingdom, of course. Kingdom of Heaven Embassy Ministries, kingdom living now. What else are we going to talk about? What else would they be talking about in the embassy of the United States of America? Or the Canadian High Commission? Or the British High Commission? What would they be talking about, right? So as we talk about the things concerning the kingdom of God, we've been talking about growing up in Christ. And in the last teaching, uh, which would have been on the 25th of July, I, t I, I, I read from the latter portion of Acts chapter 18, which was a part of the previous teaching before that. And I tied it into chapter 19 of the book of Acts, where we're looking at the idea of discipleship in the book of Acts. So how did we get here? We started out with... Matthew chapter 28 as the base, verses 16 through to 20. At the beginning, I read the entire chapter, which highlights the resurrection of Jesus Christ after his arrest, his trial. There was a religious trial and there was a political trial. The religious was with the high priest. Political was with Pilate and Herod. He was eventually sentenced to death by crucifixion. He died, and that was what was prophesied. He would, he would be crucified, so he couldn't die any other way. He couldn't die by stoning, by, you know, whatever else they, they might have had. That was the way that he should die. So he was crucified, he died, taken down, buried. And the, in the Matthew chapter 28, we have the account of the resurrection, coming back from the dead after three days and three nights. And in verse 16, it tells us that there was an appointment that was made between the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples before he went to the cross because he only spoke to them alone during the, 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 it, the, his, his life, his living before the cross, he only spoke to the disciples about his death. He never spoke about it publicly. So he told them that they should meet him at this place after his resurrection. <laughs> Was he able to keep that appointment? Let's see. In verse 16 of Matthew chapter 28 through to verse 20, he says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Will he keep any appointment that he has made with us? Will he keep any promise that he made to us? Will he? Verse 17 says, when they saw him, they worship him, but some doubted. And in verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, immersing them. That's the, that's the plan for discipling the believers. That at the end of the day, when you're properly discipled, you would come to know God perfectly as your father. And you would come to embrace perfectly your sonship in Christ. Immerse them into the Father. Immerse them into the Son. Immerse them into the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe to obey all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So this is the base. This is the foundation on which the teaching growing up in Christ started out on. And we looked at different things, different pieces of the puzzle, as I call it, 
to bring out the whole, the truth of what we're looking at in growing up in Christ. And the idea of discipleship is important to that. The idea of discipleship is important to that. So after we looked at the scriptures that I like clearly, clear scriptures show that we ought to grow in Christ. There's a growth that we're destined to come into. And we look at the making of a disciple based on what is said in verse 19. Of course, we looked at all authority given in verse 18 before we looked at that. And after looking at the making of a disciple, we looked at the idea of discipleship, why he commanded them to go and make disciple. Now we're looking at the idea of discipleship in the book of Acts. So we ended in the last teaching in Acts chapter 19, as the Holy Spirit led me to speak on the idea of discipleship and things that came out of that teaching, I stopped at verse 7. So I want to go back and pick up in chapter 19 and follow through as we continue to look at the idea of discipleship in the book of Acts. Look for the occurrence of the word disciple or disciples. And look at the context as you read. Go back and read it. And look at the context. Look at the, the circumstances. Look at the events. Look at what's playing out of this. And we today who are believers in Christ, I was going to say followers because if we're true followers of Christ, then we are disciples. We are apprentices. But there's not a lot of us that is in the present reality of the church today that are true followers of Christ. We say it with our lips, but our heart is disconnected from that truth. Our heart is far from such. It, the time has come that our heart must be one with our lips. Our lips must be one with our heart. That what we say is what we're living. What we're living is what we say. So in the book of Acts chapter 19, I want to go back and look at what we read I just read through and continue as we look at the idea of discipleship in the book of Acts. We see here, as I also read from the last, uh, 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 maybe about four or five ch verses in chapter 18, talking about Apollos. So verse chapter 19, open up with mentioning Apollos being in Corinth. And he says, while he was in Corinth, of course, teaching and preaching the word, and it, it tells us in chapter 18 that he was vigorously opposing publicly, opposing the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, who did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, and showing them from the scriptures that Jesus is indeed the very Christ. So in chapter 19 it says, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth. That Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? And I asked a question in the last teaching. And I want to ask a question again as I read it. Those of you that are watching right now, some of you watched, some of you watched the last teaching. I ask you the question, did you think about it? Did you really give yourself to it? And I'm going to ask again, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? When you say you believe, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Because receiving the Holy Spirit is a part of that belief. If I say that I believe in God, if I say that I believe in Christ, if I say that I believe in Jesus, I must open myself. I must also perfectly believed in the Holy Spirit to the point of receiving the Holy Spirit. If I don't, if I am a part of debating the Holy Spirit, if I am a part of debating the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you are not a true believer in God. You are not a true believer in the Christ, in Jesus. You are not. 
I can't stop you from saying it, but I'm telling you, based on the authority of the word, based on the authority of God, based on the authority of the Holy Spirit, you are not. You are not. I can't stop you from saying, as I said, and you will continue to, but there is a judgment that is already activated. And why do you want to continue that path? The apostles asked, when he saw these disciples, have you, have, you, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believe? So they said to him, we have not so much of, as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Wow. There, there is, there, I believe with all of my heart that there are believers who have not even heard the truth about the Holy Spirit today. Today. In the United States of America, where we have, the, I believe, the most churches in the world in terms of number, in the Caribbean where there is so much church and religiosity is so strong, there's a lot of people that have not heard the truth about the Holy Spirit. And yet they have a 15-pound Bible walking around with, and they have not read it. And even they have not seen in their reading... And these are people that devote themselves to read and argue scriptures. But many of them, their eyes are blinded to the truth. And I pray today that even as many of you watch, if you are blinded, that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the scales, the blindness will fall off and you will see the truth for the first time in your life. I pray God that it will be true. They said, we have not heard whether... There is a Holy Spirit. So Paul said to them, into what then were you baptized? And the conversation continued and they said to Paul, John, into John's baptism. And verse 14, verse 4, then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism, with a baptism of repentance saying to the people at that time that they should believe on him who would come after him, John, and that is on Christ Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit came came upon them. There are preachers that are afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit because they, they're afraid that they're going to lose crowd. They're afraid that they're going to lose fans. They're afraid that they're going to lose subscribers. They're afraid that they're going to lose, you know, whatever. I, I don't care about that. I don't care if you want to unsubscribe. I don't care. Wh who, whose loss is that? Huh? When it comes to the truth of God's word, you never Never, never compromise the word to get fans and to get subscription and to get, and to get fans and to get thumbs up and to get comments. And No! Did Jesus do that? Did the prophets do that? Did the apostles do that? Did we see that anywhere in the book of, in the, in the book of Acts? Look at the things that the apostles face. Look at the things that come up against the church. Did they compromise the word? When the apostles were beaten and threatened and put in prison and they were, the angels came and released them and they were found on the temple step preaching the following morning and they sent and called them and bring them before the council again. And they said, did not we strictly command you not to preach in this man's name, bringing this man's blood upon us? And Peter, look at the council. Peter, look at the council. And he said, we ought to obey God rather than man. So you can beat us, threaten us, even kill us. We are going to obey God. We're going to obey God. Who, who, who is your allegiance? Who, who, who has your allegiance? Who, 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 is, who is it that your allegiance is given to? The living God or your religious ideas, your religious beliefs, your doctrinal beliefs, your opinions, your denominations, or is it the living God? If it is, then what I am saying 
you're going to hear the Holy Spirit speaking through it. You're going to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And I pray God that it will bring about sincere repentance. I pray to God that that will be true for you. Hallelujah. The scripture says in verse 5, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. Verse 8. So I stop at verse 7 in the last teachings. In verse 8, let me pick up and continue. It says, And he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months. So he stayed in this upper part of Ephesus, this upper part of the region, and where he saw these disciples at the beginning when he went there, and he asked them the question, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, no, we didn't hear about it. They were baptized. They were rightly baptized in, into who Christ is. They accept who Christ is. Hands were laid on them by the apostles. They were experienced the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. They prophesied. And he remained in that place for three months. And the Bible says he spoke boldly, reasoning, and watches and persuading Persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. You remember how I started out here? Talking about kingdom of heaven embassy ministries. Talking about kingdom living now. And I said, if you believe that I'm making this up, before you jump and give thumbs down and turn off and do whatever, go and check the word. Look at this. The apostle Paul stayed in this place for three months, speaking to them, persuading. It says, he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. This is what the apostles preached throughout the book of Acts. Even when preachers are debating whether Paul preached salvation, the gospel of salvation, or he preached the gospel of faith, or he preached the gospel of grace, or he preached the gospel of this or God. It is clear. If you, if, you, if, you, if you go back and look at the book of Acts and see the regions that they go, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That was what was commanded. And Paul later on in Galatia, he said to the church in Galatia as they were playing around, he says, he says, if I or an angel from God or any other man come and preach another gospel than that which I preach unto you, let him be accursed. Now, what gospel did he preach? The evidence is clear. We see he stayed in this place for three months, reasoning, boldly speaking, and reasoning and persuading them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. So everything that he was talking about, everything that he was preaching, everything that he was teaching, it was coming out of the heart of the kingdom. It was coming out of the heart of the kingdom of God. Verse 9, watch this. But when some were hardened and did not believe, did not believe the things concerning the kingdom of God, like many today in the church, there are many preachers who don't believe it. Therefore, they don't teach it and they criticize it. And anyone who is teaching and preaching it, they speak against them and they, 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 they vilify them. <laughs> Do I care? <laughs> Do I look like or sound like I care about what they want to think or say? Do I care what you want to believe at the end of the day when I teach and preach the things concerning the kingdom of God? It's not my loss. Verse Nine, but when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way. So you notice, the message of the kingdom or the kingdom was seen as the way. Not a way, the way. The way of life. It says, when some were hardened and did not believe and spoke evil of the way before the multitude... He, Paul, departed from them 
and withdrew and withdrew the disciples. And withdrew the disciples. You see that? Underline that. Circle that. You see that? We see in chapter, in verse 2, in chapter, in verse 1, there were some disciples there. And now, when Paul stayed there for three months, reasoning and persuading about the things concerning the kingdom of God, and when some hardened their heart and refused to believe and spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he, Paul, departed from there and withdrew the disciples from there. So the disciples that were there, he said, come on, don't stay here. Don't let these people poison your minds. Come with me. He withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, Tyrannus, and this, watch this, and this, this continued for two years. So in the upper region of, of, of Ephesus, when he was there, he stayed there for three months, reasoning about the kingdom of God. Opposition showed up. He took the disciples with him. He went into another place. And he stayed there for two years. Two years. So that all who dwell in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Both Jews and Greeks. We know what the word of the Lord Jesus is. It's the things concerning the kingdom. Verse 8. We know when it says the way, what it is talking about. Life in the kingdom of God. And kingdom living is us who have come to faith in Christ, living from the very nature, the very character of who God is. Now, in this world, let your light so shine before men that's living, that they may see your good works and come and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's kingdom living now. Kingdom living now. In verse 11, it says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Watch this. Look at the unusual characteristics of the miracles, of some of the miracles. It says, so that even unkerchiefs, this, this is unusual, unkerchiefs or aprons, were brought from his body to the sick and the disease, left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. In the last teaching that I did Sunday past, I, the Holy Spirit had me emphasizing a, a little longer than I wanted to, and the whole topic of speaking in tongues. And I talk about the great debate that exists in the church today. And it needs to stop. It needs to stop. And it needs to stop now. There's also a great debate about healing, about miracles. There are those who say that there's no miracle today. The last miracle, miracle ended when the last apostle died. There's no healing today. So whoever believes that and even dare to give themselves and to manifest that, oh, that's demonic. That's demonic. That's Demons, that's not of God. There's no miracle today. There's no healing today. You know, Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, name it, Baptists, Anglican, Methodist, Catholic, and all. And, uh, and even in these very denominations, you have certain people that believe it. And there are those who don't believe it. The same thing we see playing out in the book of uh, part believe this, part don't believe Part takes with the, the, the side with the disciple. Part takes side with the unbelieving Jews. So it's not new. It's a demon, of, of course, that is behind that, which Satan is at work to bring the church into this place of schism and division and separate us from the purpose for which God has ordained and established the church, to, how the, what the church is supposed to be and how the church is meant to function in the earth. When the devil do all these things and we, we, we take it, hook, line, and sinker, we swallow the pills. 
And, 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 and we don't have to continue to do so. We don't have to. And we need to stop. We need to repent. We need to come back to the, the truth. We need to come back to the order. We need to come back to the standard. We need to come back to the blueprint. The book of Acts is here for us to see when the church fall out of alignment, what that alignment is, what it looks like, and what is it that we need to come back to. So, we see without any shadow of a doubt that God, where it started with Jesus Christ, he commanded the disciples that they would continue it. He said, the works that I do, you will do also. So God was the one who started it through his son and decided, and he, he willed that it would continue. It wasn't the apostles who took it upon themselves or Jesus started something and it ended. And as we say, it continues. It continues up until today. And we see here that it was God who was doing it and God is doing it and still doing it today. It says in verse 11 again, now God worked. You notice God was the one doing it. So Paul was simply working with God, allowing it to manifest. It's a, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Are you in need of an unusual miracle right now? Are you in a situation that you need an unusual escape? You need an unusual provision to show up because there is an unusual need. What is that unusual situation or unusual circumstances that it takes, it, it, it's going to take an unusual God showing up to work an unusual miracle for you? And he's there, he's there. And if I will believe it, I will experience it. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the disease left them and the evil spirit went out of them. Unusual. But God is an unusual God. Verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jews exorcists took it upon themselves. And Paul have the disciples around them, so they continue to be discipled in this, through this process. Then some of the itinerant Jews, Jewish exorcists, took it up on themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, because they saw, because they saw the unusual miracles that is manifesting through Paul. They now, they're copying, they're copying this. Be careful. Be careful. They're copying this and they didn't know Christ. Watch this. They said, we exercise you by the name whom Paul preached. Verse 14. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. Verse 15 says, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Show me your ID. If we're going to obey your instructions and your directives, let us see some credentials that allow us to know that you have the right to use that authority or that power that you, you're trying to exercise. Who are you? Verse 16. Then the men in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, empowering, overpowering them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. The demons in the men that they took to cast out tore off their clothes, stripped them naked, and wounded them. Wow. 
while previously we see in verse 12, verse 11 and 12, when Paul speak, when Paul did what he did, handkerchiefs, aprons, was brought from his body and brought to the sick. The Bible said the disease left them and the devil, the evil spirits left and they didn't argue. Notice now they say, who are you? Jesus we know and Paul we know. These demons saying this, who are you? And they were healed when Paul operated in pure authority. And this was a sign because Jesus said these signs would follow. He would cast out demons. That again. So there is a debate about speak, speaking in tongues. There is a debate about healing, miracles, and about casting out of demons. There, there are those who say that such thing does not, it's not supposed to happen. And anyone who attempt to do so, you're categorized as what? Being of the devil. The, uh, now, those of us who are truly following Christ, should that move us? Jesus himself was called a devil. Jesus was accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. So what should that do for us if we're truly of Christ? We should be more committed. We should go deeper. We should go higher, go wider. Not pulling back because somebody comment or somebody post it on Facebook or today in today's world, social media is where they have the trial. You know, we have the judge, we have the jury, and we have the prosecutor. That's where the trial takes place, and that's where we have all the hangman. It doesn't matter. It's, 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 we, we, we are committed to the living God, and this is a part of the process. We were warned by Jesus himself. Blessed are you when men shall persecute you, revile you, and come against you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. He said rejoice and be exceedingly. He didn't say pull back. He didn't say run away and hide. So rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And know that your reward in heaven is great. Your reward in heaven is great. It is for this purpose. It's for this purpose we were born. It's for this purpose we came into this world. It's for this purpose we are now in the kingdom of God for such a time as this. Don't pull back. Continue in grace. Don't pull back. Continue in the Lord. Don't pull back. Continue in the faith. Don't pull back. Continue in the kingdom. Continue to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you have need of. It will be added unto you. Don't pull back. Don't pull back. Watch this. Look, at, look again at verse 16. He said, Then the men in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Verse 17. This, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. Dwelling in Ephesus. What happened here with the demonic spirits and these men was it, it became known. So what happened now? Watch this. And fear, the fear of God fell on them. The fear of God fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And the name of the Lord Jesus became greater. It spread more. It was embraced more. It was believed on more. There was a greater devotion to him. Verse 18, and many who had believed came. Watch this. 
in this region what's going on. And many who had come to faith in Christ came confessing and telling their deeds, telling their evil deeds, what they had done. The, the, the true repentance taking place as the Spirit is moving and the fear of God fell upon them because of the manifestation of what they saw and heard. And the Bible says in verse 19, also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them. They took out the Harry Potter books. They took out all the books that they know was not of God and that would have ended them growing up in Christ and would have ended them being a true apprentice because they were an apprentice of sin. They were an apprentice in sin. You notice they were practicing magic and all kind of stuff. They bring the books out and burn them in the sight of all. They made a fire heap and they burned these books. Burn them. Any book that is going to confuse you or take you off the path, you forbid it. I've heard about the book of the Maccabe Maccabees and the Maccabean Bible. The first time I heard about this was Rasta, the Rasta people talking about this. And that, that's a true Bible. The book of the Maccabees is simply about the history of the Maccabean Jews during the time of um, certain things happening in Jerusalem and when the temple was defiled and what they did, there was a revolt of the, by the Maccabean Jews against what was coming against Jerusalem and so on. So there's the history of it. So there's the book of the Maccabeans. They were Jews. There's nothing magical. We want to make it, oh, and, and, and not and anybody can read this and that, that, that. Come on. Nonsense. So some of us are tempted to go and read it. Then we hear about the book of um, Thomas, the book of uh, Judas, the book of this, and books that they said that should have been added to the Bible and it was taken out and all this stuff that is meant by the wicked one to frustrate the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. And when we open ourselves up to these things, can we handle the division that it's going to bring to our soul? As God told Adam and Eve in the garden, do not, he said, you see the tree that bring forth the fruit of the good knowledge of good and evil? Don't eat it. It's not that God was hiding anything from them. God knows that if they do, it is going to divide, bring about a division in them, and it's going to create a warfare. Will they be able to win it? Would they be able to overcome? And today, many of us expose ourselves to various teachings on YouTube. We're watching all kind of black Jews teaching. We're watching all kind of teaching. And we're all over the place. We're not steady in grace. We're not steady in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not steady in the kingdom. I don't need to read these books. I know about them. I hear about them. But I am not going to go and submit myself to these things. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. What we have here, is it enough to introduce us to Jesus? Is it enough for us to see Christ? Is it enough for us to come to faith in the Son of God? Is it enough for us to come into the kingdom? Yes, it is. More than enough. You're free. So don't debate and argue with me. I'm not going to debate and argue with you. No, I won't. So you're free. But I'm saying, at what cost? At what price? They brought their books. They brought out their books that they used to practice magic and witchcraft and whatever. They burned it in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them. And it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money if you bring it down even to our time now. 50,000 pieces of silver. It was worth, but they didn't care. They said, we have now come into a new way of life. 
We're new creations in Christ. Old things are passed away, so our whole life is, we're dead to it, and they burn. You notice they didn't give the books to their relatives or their friends. They give, give it to anyone. They burned it. They destroyed it. Because if it's not good for us, it's not good for anyone else. They burned the legacy. And the verse says in verse 20, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So the word of the Lord. And we know what the word of the Lord is, as I said before. In verse 10, when he said that the word of the Lord was heard by those who dwell in Asia. The word of the Lord must be defined based on what is said in verse 8. That Paul was in the synagogue and he, in, and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And we see it in verse 10 when it says the word of the Lord Jesus. And now again it says in verse 20 that the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed, which is the things concerning the kingdom of God. Verse 21. Verse 21 says this. When these things were accomplished, when these things were accomplished, wow, what things? The manifestation of the demons wounding and stripping these individuals of their clothing who went in to take it upon themselves. They don't know Jesus. They don't have any, any uh, they don't have the legal authority <laughs> to do what they were doing. They were copying Paul and the demons asked them, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? We, 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 command you, we command you in the name that Paul preached. And the demons know the name that Paul preached. So they said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? So when these things happen, it brought the fear of God upon the entire region to the point where people brought out their magic books, their witchcraft books, and they burn it. So now verse 21 says, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. I must also see Rome. In verse 22, so he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him. Two of those who ministered to him. So he had people who were ministering to him, ministering to his needs and so on. They didn't behave like, of course, the preachers that we see today. These were done out of purity and humility and um, servant would purely. So those who ministered to him, he sent two of them into Macedonia. And the scripture said, two of them who ministered to him was who? Timothy and Erastus. Timothy and Erastus. And I think it's in chapter 16 that Paul was first introduced to Timothy, a disciple. In, it says a certain disciple that was in Philippi, uh, in that region, was known, his name was Timothy. And so now we see Timothy continued with Paul being a disciple, being an apprentice of Paul. And he was also one who ministered to Paul and Erastus. So he sent Paul, he sent Timothy and Erastus into Macedonia. But he himself stayed in Asia for a time. In verse 23, it says, And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. Remember what the way is? We go back up to verse 9. And we see in verse 8, when he spoke about the things concerning the kingdom, there were those who were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way. So now, 
we come down here to verse 21 and it says, About that time there arose a great commotion about the way, about the things concerning the kingdom of God and those who are believing and coming into the kingdom. It is called the way. It says, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silver smith, so he dealt with silver, who made silver thrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. So it, the, the profit was huge. He said it brought no small profit. So the profit was huge, huge where the silver shrines of Diana, the goddess Diana of the Ephesians was concerned. Verse 25 says, he, Paul, called them together, it, not, not Paul, but he, Demetrius, called his, the craftsmen together of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade, by making silver shrine of the goddess Diana. He says, you know, we have our prosperity by this trade. He says, moreover, this is Demetrius speaking, the, the silver smith. He says, moreover, you see and hear that not only, not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. He says, so not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be dispute, despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. So they saw the gospel of the kingdom that Paul was preaching and people coming to faith in Christ, they saw it as a threat to their trade and to the worship of the goddess Diana. Now watch what, watch what, watch this. Verse 28. Now when they heard this, the people that he had called together, that Demetrius the copper simit, the silver simit rather, had called over to himself and he's speaking. When they heard what he was saying, they were full of wrath. Verse 28. And cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Watch this. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed in to the altar with one accord. The altar of Diana, having seized Gaius and Archicus of Macedonia. They were Macedonians, Paul travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go in the people, into the people, verse 30, as I said, look for the word disciples, our disciple, occurring in the reading. I think this is about the third time. Verse 30 says, when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. The disciples realized the danger or the threat that was happening, that was brewing here, so they did not allow him. Verse 31 says, Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. So he had those who were in official position. They had come to faith in Christ and they were friends of Paul and they plead with him and said, do not, because they, they know, of course they would be privy to information and things that is going on in the city. So they said, don't go. Verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and some another for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. Wow. Verse 33, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. 
But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours straight, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Two hours. Imagine. Two hours. And you're preaching the pure word of God for two hours and people start complaining. People start losing focus. People want to go. People leave. People talk about you preach long. And they were giving adoration to the goddess Diana for two hours. Two hours. A false goddess. A false god for two hours. Verse 35 says, And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus. <laughs> Verse 36, Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. Verse 37, For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. They didn't blaspheme your goddess. They didn't rob your temple. So why are you doing what you're doing? Because as it said, that the crowd came together, but there were many who were confused. They didn't even know why they came together. And with all this riot and everything that was going on, they were confused. So when the city clerk said this, verse 38 says, Therefore, if Demetrius, which is the silver smith, which called the, 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 the crowd together, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a cause against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro counselors Let them bring charges against one another there. Not here. Why are we doing this? Go to the courts with it. Verse 39. But if you have any other injury, make it to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. Verse 40. For we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. We're going to have to give an account to those who are in high authority. Why did this happen in the city today? The governor and the king, we, need, we are going to have to give an account. It says, we're in danger of being called in question for today's uproar. These, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. What is the reason for it? Verse 41. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Keep in mind why we're reading about all of this happening against the Apostle Paul and those who, are, who were his traveling, traveling um, companion. He came into the region, starting out in verse 1 of chapter 19. He came into the region of Ephesus, the upper region, the scripture says, because of kingdom practices and so on of the time. I think about even the very country that I am presently speaking to you from, Canada. Before Canada gained independence, uh, complete, their independence was complete in, in the 80s, 1980, uh, somewhere in the 80s. Canada was a full dominion of the British Kingdom. At one point, France also had influence over Canada. So we know of Newfoundland and 
Quebec is, is a, a part of that product today. French is the, the first language in Quebec, while, while English is the first language in Canada on a whole, and French is the second language. But where Quebec is concerned, French is their first language. So they pride themselves in that because of the Kingdom of France that once influenced this region. And then the British came in, and it was ceded to the British Kingdom. So Canada was known as the dominion of the British Empire. The, the province that I'm in, it's, it's known as Ontario. And there was also, um, it was known as, there was the Upper Ontario and Lower Ontario. And it was divided based upon governance. So, they, you know, how they governed the, the, the province, they had Upper and Lower so here we're reading in, in, in this where it says that when Paul came into this region, Apollos was in Corinth. Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. So all of what we're reading now is in Ephesus. And when he came to Ephesus, he came across disciples, the idea of discipleship in the book of Acts. And he dealt with the disciples in, in, in that he met in that first part of that region. Then after a while... Certain things happened where there was certain opposition that was taking place. And the Bible said he took the disciples with him and he went into another area, but he was still in Ephesus. And he stayed there for a total of two years, preaching the word of the Lord, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God to both Jews and Greeks. So from both Jews and Greeks, they're coming to faith in Christ. They're believing that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Then we see... God affirming the word that Paul is preaching, affirming Paul being of him with unusual miracles being wrought by the hands of Paul. And some take it upon themselves when they heard about demons being, you know, leaving people because of what happened through Paul. And as a result of the manifestation of the demonic power against those who took it upon themselves who didn't know Christ, the fear of God fell upon the city. And when the fear of God fell upon the city, many burn their witchcraft books. Burn the books that they were practicing to do these stuff. Publicly, they did it. Now, Demetrius realized that there is a threat here. That if we allow this to continue... We're going to lose our profits. We're going to lose our business. We're going to lose our prosperity. So he decided to call the assembly together. So that's why we see when the city clerk spoke to them and quiet them and, this is, and, 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 and sent them back home. This is all because of what is happening in light of the gospel of the kingdom being preached in the region. And we see whenever the gospel is rightly preached, it is going to create... <laughs> it is going to create either revival or riot. If you notice, it said that this riot that has been that has come about, we're going to be called into question to give an account for it. So, as Paul preached the gospel of the kingdom, staying in the region for three years, for two years, it created a riot while revival is taking place. Revival takes place to the point where we see people bring out their witchcraft books and burn it. And they're confessing their evil deeds. And these things begin to happen. We see riot on the other hand. We shouldn't be surprised that even today, those of us who truly teach and preach the gospel of the kingdom for what it is, when you, those who say that they are with you turn against you, we experience false brethren. There, there, there are those who poison the minds of people against you. And that people end up hating you. And if you sit down and have a good talk with them, they can't even tell the reason why they hate you. Because they take the words of those who are against you. And though anytime, anytime you find someone, because if you notice, Demetrius didn't keep it to himself. He assembled his fellow craftsmen. And he began to poison their mind and instill these things in them and cause them now to create an uproar 
cause a riot in the city. I have experienced that in Jamaica. I've experienced it from my, the denomination that I was a part of. I experienced it in Jamaica, going around and teaching. I experienced it in the ministry that started there. I experienced it coming to Canada here. I experienced it. And right now, we're going through a transition, and it's as a result of teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and those who claim who came in falsely and, pu and put themselves in a position to be of Christ and claim that they're supporting the kingdom. And I've been saying it for a long time. If you draw near me and you're not right, you're going to be exposed. And continue to manifest. It will not move me because I know the real reason behind the scenes why it is so. For those of us who are committed to Christ and committed to bringing, to be carriers of the kingdom of God, we must anticipate these things and it should never move us. We must remain faithful even until death. The idea of discipleship in the book of Acts. We see the apostles playing an integral part to that. Those who were prophets, we see it talks about prophets and teachers and evangelists and those who were left in certain region to pastor. We see all of that. And it's playing out in the idea of discipleship. And we need to return to this. If the church is going to be restored, preparing the way for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must come back to the pattern. We must come back to the blueprint. We must come back to the standard and the order of the book of Acts. And that's why I, the Holy Spirit is say, speaking through me, talking about the idea of discipleship in the book of Acts. We must. It's not a if, it's not a maybe when, we must come back to it. I'm talking to the true church. We must come back to it. And there are things that we're going to face and encounter, but we should never be Afraid. We should never be afraid. If you are not a disciple, a true disciple of Christ yet, I implore you, be, be. And the infilling, the baptism, the drenching, Whatever term you want to use, that whatever you're comfortable with, the dipping, the smearing, the immersing of the Holy Spirit is important to that. We should stop debating it. Speaking in tongues, we should stop debating it. It's important to that idea of being a true disciple of Christ. Casting out of demons, healing the sick, Miracles, we should stop debating these things. I'm speaking, I'm speaking to those who are truly of Christ, who have come to submit to the king, that it's not an option, it's not a suggestion, it's a command that is important to the existence and life in the kingdom of God now. We should embrace these things. Jesus himself was a clear example and pattern of such. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was baptized into the power of the Holy Spirit. He proudly talked about the Holy Spirit, carried the Holy Spirit, manifest the Holy Spirit. He performed miracles. He performed healing. He did the things that the Father willed and wanted him to do. And the Father said, I'm well pleased. He commissioned the church to continue, to continue. Why are we divided over these things that Jesus commands the church? So we need to return to the pattern, to the principle, and to the idea. And I pray that as we continue to watch and listen to these, these series of teachings, growing up in Christ, the all authority given from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through to 20, the making of a disciple, the idea of discipleship, the idea of discipleship in the book of Acts, I pray that we will hear the voice of the Spirit at such a time as this. We will come into the kingdom with both feet, not one foot out, one foot in, both feet in the kingdom, locked in the kingdom, living in the kingdom, living from the kingdom, and nothing else. 
And I want to encourage you to continue in the faith, to continue in the grace of God, continue in the kingdom of God, which is all the same. But if we look at it closer, there is something unique that each is bringing to bear in our lives. Continue to grow up in Christ. Continue to be a disciple of the living God, a lifelong disciple. It's not a part-time thing. And being a son of God, it's eternal. Sonship is eternal. And discipleship in time is meant for us to grow up in that fullness and to continue. So as long as my body exists in time, I am a disciple of Christ. And that is what we should be proud to be called and not a Christian. A son of God being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Learning of him moment by moment and day by day. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you. The first day of August 2021. Different things that is being thought about even this day. And across the Caribbean, Canada for the first time is recognizing it's not a federal holiday, but they're recognizing it as it was emancipation in, in the 1800s, 1838, I believe. There was a, tech, a, a proclamation, a declaration that was made of slaves being freed in the Caribbean, in the Americas on a whole. And so it is being celebrated. Father, and I think about emancipation for us who once lived in sin. And we were delivered from the kingdom of darkness and brought and placed into the kingdom of the son of your love. According to Colossians 1 verse 12 and 13. So as the world in some way, in some places celebrate Emancipation Day, we too, not waiting for a particular day, every single day of our life, we are grateful to Christ for emancipating us, setting us free, delivering us from the kingdom of darkness, from bondage and making us free. I am grateful to you, Father. Many of us are grateful to you around the world today for freedom. May we continue to live in that freedom. May we open ourselves to hear the word and everything that continues to come to us where that is concerned. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that the word will be more important to us. Your word will become more important to us than the next breath we take, the food we eat, life on a whole. And we will always keep your word at the top above every one. Doesn't matter who they are, where they are, what they have, where they came from, your word is always at the top. Above my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, my friend, my wife, my husband, my children, it doesn't matter who. May that become true for us all. May the leaders, Father, that you have raised up even in this time, for such a time as this, and in the kingdom, may they be true and continue. May they remain true and continue to be devoted only to you and the things concerned in the kingdom. So that the believers can continue to grow properly and be properly discipled into the truth of who you are and what we're meant to be about. Father, thank you for the ministry of the word, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and what I fail of asking, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I am able to ask or we're able to ask according to the power that is at work within us. Father, let people experience the filling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the drenching of the Holy Spirit, or whatever they want to see our clay. May we go back to the Word and see what you says about the Holy Spirit, what you said about the Holy Spirit even for today, that there wasn't a time where the Holy Spirit would stop while humans are on the earth. Even now, the promise is unto you and to your children and to all whom the Lord shall call from afar. May we see the truth about tongues. May we see the truth about miracles and healings. May we see the truth about casting out of demons and stop debating and stop dividing. May we, may we rise up against the schism, the isms, and all the things that the enemy has been doing against the church and we're receiving it. May we resist the devil and he must flee 
So Father, thank you for those of us who continue to grow up in our sonship and being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ without any shame, without any embarrassment. Thank you. So Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth, even as it is in heaven. Be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you and I up and to continue to give us an inheritance among all the sanctified ones. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, unto us, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. I love you. I bless you. Hug, squeeze, shake a little. And God's willing, I will see you again soon in our next um, meeting, which would be fasting, uh, would be the first fasting meeting in the month of August, as the first and third Saturday of each month, we take that and set it aside as a time of corporate fasting. And as I said, once we continue to give ourselves to the principle of it, it is true for wherever we are, the spirit is there to bring about the results, the reward of such. So even now at this time where we're virtually doing this for the time being, we continue to experience the truth. And I want to thank those of you again who continue to be faithful in supporting this ministry and supporting the kingdom the advancement and the establishment of the kingdom of God in the lives of people and throughout the world. Thank you for your faithfulness, your giving, your support, your ministry in various ways. I bless you and I thank you and I know that your reward will not be in vain. Your work will not be in vain rather. Your reward is sure. The God of heaven, the Bible says, he will not forget your work, your work, and that which you have shown towards his name and towards the saints and towards those whom he has called to bring his word. As we see even in the, in the reading in Acts there, we see Paul and Erastus. They were ministers who they, they give themselves to minister to the apostle Paul, minister to his need and so on. So I bless God for those of you who the Spirit open your eyes to see certain things and you're willing to commit yourself to such. And uh, others may see it as being, you know, in various things. You're, you're, you're a follower of this man, you're this, there. Because I remember they, they're, they're, they label some of you as Bobby followers. Who is Bobby? Who is Bobby following? Because, you, you know, you could say Timothy was Paul follower. Uh, Erastus and many others. But who was Paul? Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I'm saying the same thing to you today. Follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following Christ, run. Run for your life. Run. And anybody that you're following, if they're not following Christ, run. Run for your life. Run for eternal life. Run. And as we're going through a transition, I'm going to say to you again, for those of you that you know you would normally come drop off your offering on Tuesdays or Saturday during the streaming time and Sundays, call, call, call. And we're going to send out information to you. Will, you you hear uh, uh, previously about the transition that is taking place. Be mindful of that and Call, get information before you move because of what's happening presently right now. Okay? I love you. I bless you. And God's willing, I will see you in the next meeting. God's willing, fasting. So until then, I love you. I bless you. And I'll see you by faith and in the spirit. And you'll see me on whatever screen you're watching from. Hug again. Squeeze again. Shake again. Until then, bye-bye.